expand our imagination. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. Today we're going to take our Monday look at this year's election with CBS News chief political consultant Mark Amender, who joins us every week for this dissection. Mark, I want to start, let's start in Florida with the governor, Charlie Crist, trying to become a senator, but he's in limbo at the moment. What's up with him? And he has a big decision to make by April 30th. Um, that's when he has to decide whether he wants to run as a Republican, which is currently his trajectory, or as an independent. But the Republican Party in Florida has essentially given up on him, and there are signs that he's given up on the Republican Party and that he is beginning the transition ideologically uh, and substantively to move toward that independent bid. In the polls now, the Republican primary polls, he trails by double digits to Marco Rubio. Having once been up 30 points. Having once been up 30 points. But in, in a three-way race with the Democrat Kendrick Meek, with Marco Rubio running as a Republican, uh, Charlie Crist, uh, you know, is in much better shape if he runs as an independent. What happens, though, if he actually makes the shift? Because suddenly he loses uh, a lot of the people who are supporting him as a Republican. And um, indeed, uh, the question is whether he can raise enough money to compete with Marco Rubio and Kendrick Meek will be very well funded. So he has a decision to make. And there is uh, there's some talk also that he might drop out altogether and run right. maybe in 2012, right. um, which is also part of this part of this limbo question. Um, what happens if if he goes as an independent, though? I mean, um, you know, does he have? Is there a middle ground in that race that he can appeal to uh, in Florida, or or because Rubio, you know, because this is an off-year election, the independent votes kind of don't exist as much as they would say in a general. Uh, th I think the latter is, is more is more apt. I mean, it's going to be very, very tough. This is a this is a midterm year um, and uh, he's not running in a gubernatorial election. Um, he's not running on the types of things he ran for when he was running for governor, which is uh, quite a different set of policies um, than running for senator. So he's going to have a, a tough time. And it's one reason, incidentally, why Democrats are so excited about the potential that he either drops out of the race or that he, he flips and runs as an independent because it suddenly gives their candidate, Kendrick Meek, about whom half of Floridians don't know anything, uh, a real chance to win. Right. Okay. Let's move on to some of these other races. Um, let's start with Hawaii. What's happening in Hawaii? Um, you know, Democrats have won 10 House special elections in a row, and that could end next month um, with a special election in Hawaii. If you think about that famous now, now famous New York's race for New York's 23rd congressional district, where uh, the Republican leadership-backed candidate um, was uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, well, was... Overthrown by the Tea Party activists, Right, was overthrown by the Tea Party activists, essentially handing the victory to the Democrats. Well, the opposite could happen in this race. This is Barack Obama's home district. This is the district where he grew up. It's a very Democratic district. Um, but there are two Democrats in this race, one of whom, Ed Case, is backed by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, mm -hmm. the other of whom, uh, Colleen Hanabusa, uh, the state Senate president, is backed um, by a lot of the local uh, politicians and activists there. So you have that conflict, which could give the Republican, Charles Zhao, uh, a, 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 a leg up in this district, which... Uh, in the 30s, since 1971, has only gone to Republican once. Right, so a reversal of the ticket splitting that we were talking about in Florida, where right. that would benefit a, the Democrats. It's a race in this case, that wouldn't would necessarily tell us a lot about the national mood, but it is a. It could be a Republican pickup. Now, let's one that might tell us something about the national mood yeah. is in Pennsylvania. Yeah, this is John Murtha's old seat. He he held this seat for 35 years, uh, and uh, this is this is the seat. Remember where. Uh, during the presidential campaign, he described people in this who who who, um, who voted for him as racist, even though he thought Barack Obama could still win the state of Pennsylvania. Um, this blue-collar um, white ethnic vote in in the particular district, although Barack Obama did pretty well as a presidential candidate, getting 49 percent of the vote, um, but his favorable unfavorable ratings now uh, are much lower than they were. He gets. His favorable rating is about 40 percent now. Two candidates in this race. One uh, is uh, Tim uh, Burns, who a Republican businessman who has uh, support from, who has you know, plenty of money, plenty of support, um, and is doing pretty well. 
And then you have uh, Mirtha's district director, Mark Kritz, who uh, is running essentially to continue the Mirtha legacy in the district, which is a legacy of government largesse. This is a district that is very used to getting favors from government. So um, Burns is, is running on a platform that suggests that all of that, 35 years of that, was bad for the district. Mm -hmm. So if he wins, it, it'll say something about the degree to which voters are willing, even in this district where they're used to getting a lot from government, to run uh, or, or to accept an anti-government message. When people make the comparison between now and 94, one of the things Democrats say is that the reason that analogy doesn't hold is in 94 you had the corruption scandals, you had the House Bank, you had this notion that the Democrats had been in repose in the House taking advantage of all of the perks and that the government was fed up with that sense of entitlement. They say that's not in play now, but in this Mirtha race that kind of could be in play. I mean, he was seen as somebody who took advantage of the perks. Is that really at issue or is it this broader sort of anti-Obama feeling that's... Well, it'll be very interesting to see whether voters of the district, who are probably of two minds about that, because they got a lot from it, including this brand spanking new airport that very few people use, but, you know, is right in the middle of their district and brings a lot of jobs. Um, but over time, and it was actually one of the reasons why Murtha drew a fairly competitive uh, Republican challenger in the last election, um, you know, they began to see his antics uh, in, in a bit of a new light. Um, primarily, though, the, the overwhelming sense, the overwhelming force that Democrats are up against is a sense that government is, is illegitimate mm -hmm. and can't solve any problems and shouldn't solve any problems. Um, so no matter how many accomplishments they seem to rack up, whether it's health care, financial regulatory reform, uh, it's tough to see how that helps in, in, in districts like these. Okay, Mark Amateur, thanks very much. And now on to Iran. The New York Times published this weekend a piece that claimed that Defense Secretary Robert Gates believes the administration does not have a long-term policy for dealing with a nuclear Iran. Gates is now pushing back against that claim. To discuss the issue, we're joined by Michael Rubin, a Middle East scholar from the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. What did you make of the piece this weekend? Well, I thought it was very important for the administration to recognize this. To be fair, it's not just the Obama administration that hasn't had a very coherent strategy with regard to Iran. I'm not really sure that George W. Bush or Clinton before him had a coherent strategy towards Iran, but as the clock ticks ever more towards a, I mean, towards a crisis, we're finally having this wake-up call, and that's a valuable discussion to have. Give me your sense of the tea leaves of Washington here. The, the Gates memo was written in January. This piece now comes out at this moment. What's your sense, if you were to, uh, to make a, a guess about the behind the scenes, why something like this gets leaked here now, several months after the memo was written? Well, we've had a lot of discussion about um, red lines. Mm -hmm. President Obama had laid out red line that Iran would have to come clear with regard to its nuclear activities by the G20 summit in Pittsburgh last September. That came and went, and so it makes sense that this memo was written afterwards to say, hey, look, we need to have some real discussion. Well, now it's reemerging. Perhaps it was leaked because there's another discussion about what sort of sanctions we should impose on Iran. But then there's a whole debate about whether we should have any sanctions, whether we should have diplomacy, whether there's any sort of magic formula of the diplomatic, the economic, the informational, or even the military strategies. And while there was some discussion that perhaps we have to start planning for a military strategy, that in and of itself can bolster the call for diplomacy and the pressure on Iran to engage seriously. It seemed in the New York Times piece that there was a, an emerging red line, a faint red line in terms of military action. A senior administration official was quoted in that, it seemed to me, suggesting that, that, that a red line for this administration is if Iran builds the component parts, the capability to have a nuclear weapon. Maybe it doesn't build it all the way together, but is in that sort of on deck circle stage right before. Did, did you see it that way? Is that a red line that um, that the administration wants to have out there because of the way negotiations are going or because of other policy reasons? That is a red line. The problem with the administration's red lines, however, is that while the administration wants to see them uh, drawn in permanent marker, too many of the Iranians see them drawn in dotted line pencil. Um, with regard to what the red line is, when we talk about nuclear weapons, uh, Iran with nuclear weapons, what we really are talking about is a nuclear weapons capable Islamic Republic of Iran, and that's the nightmare scenario. What we're afraid of is that they stay within the nuclear non-proliferation treaty until they're about three or four days away from assembling a bomb and then stop and wait, and that's something which we really don't have the policy capacity to deal with. 
And so where do you think the negotiations will come on sanctions now, and how much teeth will they really have, do you think? Well, this is the balance which every administration has to deal with. On one hand, we can have pretty effective unilateral sanctions, especially when it comes to banking issues. But multilateral sanctions bring more international legitimacy. The problem with multilateralism is it's not all positive. The more partners you bring on board, the more compromises you need to make to the point when if you're going to have China, if you're going to have Russia on board with United Nations sanctions, what you get is pretty watered down and not so effective. So what would your guidance be if you were to give the administration advice, recognizing that they're in this difficult position that previous administrations have been in about how to proceed here? Well, two pieces of advice I would give. We talk about diplomacy first and then uh, economic sanctions, and we sequence our strategies. But at the heyday of diplomacy, both um, with Kissinger going to China, with Reagan negotiating with Gorbachev, we did all our strategies together, something called the dime paradigm, where you have diplomatic, informational, military, and economic components to any strategy, all done in conjunction with one another. And then a lesson, the second part, is a lesson we can learn from what occurred with Libya and bringing Libya's nuclear program in from the cold, is sometimes lifting sanctions is more of an um, incentive. Mm -hmm for one, once a rogue regime engages in good behavior, you lift the sanctions as an incentive. The problem is we had pretty sweeping sanctions on Libya first, and for that to work, we need to have much more sweeping sanctions on Iran now, which we can then negotiate to lift should Iran comply. Okay, wonderful. Michael Rubin, American thank Enterprise you. Institute, thank you very much. And finally, Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown made his Sunday talk show debut right here on CBS's Face the Nation. And we caught up with the junior senator and our Bob Schieffer. Take a look. Well, it was a lot of fun for us to have uh, Senator Brown. This was his first uh, Sunday morning interview as a United States senator. So I really enjoyed uh, uh, ge getting his assessment of what he thought his uh, election meant and also what he thought of Washington. Now he's been here a while. But Washington is broken. The perception is, is correct. He's pretty good at what he does. Uh, I think uh, he probably was pleased with the interview. I pressed him hard on a couple of things, or at least I thought I did. How, how can you say that? Well, uh, but he seemed to uh, uh, handle the questions very well. I don't think he uh, told me anything he didn't want me to know. Uh, but that's just fine. Yeah, it was fun. You know, I enjoyed uh, you know, obviously being on the show and, and meeting Bob again and speaking with him. And they were great questions, and I an answer them how I would answer every question, honestly and straightforward. You know, I probably should have asked him uh, if he thought uh, Sarah Palin uh, was going to be the Republican nominee. Uh, he's a very interesting person. Uh, he's probably the first freshman senator that we've asked to be on Face the Nation. Uh, this early in his term, but his election was really a thunderbolt uh, for American politics. And so having Senator Brown uh, in our little world of Sunday morning television uh, was a real scoop for us, and so uh, nobody enjoyed it more than I did. Thanks for watching Washington Unplugged. Catch us again tomorrow right here on CBSNews.com at 1230. I'm John Dickerson. Have a great day.